of mine. Uh, first off, I want to thank you for praying for Camp Evangel. Man, this summer was the best summer we had since I've been there. And this, this was my sixth or seventh summer there. And it was just a real blessing. We had an awesome staff, which I get a lot of credit. Which I give all glory to God, but I'm kind of, you know, what they see. But the staff, our counselors, is what makes the camp go. And, man, they were just phenomenal. Our, our boys and our girls both, they took the time to sit down with each individual camper at a time and make sure that they accepted Christ as their Savior or talked to them about it. And, and what really got me was after the week was over with, two of the boy counselors came up to me, and they were heartbroken. They said, I know that one of my campers went home and did not accept Christ as their Savior. Mm -hmm. And that broke their heart. Mm -hmm. And I was like... It made me happy, you know. I mean, it broke my heart for the camper, but, but they were concerned about that camper. And I told them, and when I first started out, it bothered me, but it, I said, that's not your job. It's not your job to save everybody. You made sure that they heard the gospel in a clear and present way numerous times. You did your job. It's up, it's, all the rest is up to God. We did our part. Preach the gospel is what God called us to do. And we had two, two speakers are here that spoke at camp this summer. We had awesome speakers. It was really, really great speakers that were on the level and they presented the gospel in a very clear way and in the end we had 28 souls accept Christ as their savior and I'm not a number guy I don't like numbers but you talk about encouraging though you know it was encouraging and, and we actually had a little girl who was working at camp our, our uh, theme was under construction this summer and it was good because we were building a new swimming pool which was our swimming pool is awesome it's a beautiful, brand new swimming pool, and uh, they were working on it the week before, and their daughter, their little girl, sat in on our chapel services during leadership training, and she accepted Christ at leadership training. You know, and I was like, it don't matter what happens this summer, it was all worth it. But, but for 28 kids to come to know Christ as their Savior, it was just phenomenal. And yeah. here's the cool thing about it, too, is it, it went on to my church. You know, I'm the pastor of Claypool Hill Bible Church, and I was preaching one Sunday morning, and uh, we actually had, during camp, one of our staff members, or one of our counselors, you know, they have to go through the application process, give their testimony. And I get, every chapel service, one of our counselors gets up and give their testimony so that the campers can see it. No, she got up and gave her testimony two different times. She came up to one of the girl, other and other girls and said, I haven't accepted Christ as my Savior. It's all made up a lie. And she accepted Christ as her Savior there. And, and she, I let her get up at church and give her testimony there. And one of the members of our church uh, came up to me after that service and said, Brian, I, I, in the same way, I grew up, he grew up in church, he made profession of faith, and he said, I'm not saved, and I'm going to go to hell if I die. And we got to go in the office, and, and, and he accepted Christ as his Savior. And I was like, man, what a summer. You can't get no better than that right there. You know, so thank you for your prayer. And it's all about prayers. You know, it's all about God. And we have nothing to do with it. God doesn't need us. You know, we're just worthless rags. But he chooses to use us, and it's really awesome to be a part of something. And you're a part of it, man. Praying for it is just wonderful. But I want to speak this morning about the shortest man in the Bible. Does anyone know who that was? No. It's actually wrong. Nehemiah. Way to go. The shortest, book, the shortest man in the Bible, Nehemiah. And we're going to be in Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 to 9. This was a very encouraging message to me, and I, I want to share it with you. Um, I'm going to read verses 1 to 9, and we'll talk about it a little bit. But before I read it, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day, God. I thank you for the, the blessings of camp, God. And I do pray for the ones there that made decisions, God. May they go into a, or find themselves a church to get into and to be discipled and to grow in you. And God, the ones that left there unsaved, may you convict them until they get saved, God. And I do pray for the future camps coming up. God, send us the right staff that we need there and the right campers, God, and the right speakers, God, and we give you all the glory for it. And right now, God, let your Holy Spirit give us understanding as we open your word and read it right now. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, Nehemiah 6.1. Now, it came to pass when Sanballat and Tobiah and Je Jeshem, the Arabian, and the rest of the enemies heard that I built the wall and that there was also no breach left in it, though at the time I had not set up the doors upon the gates that Sanblat and Geshem sent unto me, saying, Come, let us meet together in one of the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me mischief. 
And I sent messengers unto them, saying, I am doing a great work, so that I cannot come down. Why should, I, why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Yet they sent to me four times after this sort, and I answered them after this same manner. Then, uh, then sent Sanballat his servant unto me in the like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand, in which was written, It is reported among the heathens, and Gushem saith it, that thou and the Jews seek to rebel, for which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be their king according to these words. And thou hast also appointed prophets to, to preach of thee at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. And now it shall be reported to the king according to these words. Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Then I sent unto him, saying, There are no such things done as thou sayest, but thou feignest them in thine own heart, for they are all made, or for they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from their work, that it that it is not done. Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands and coming out of the, well this is thinking about camp too you know we was, I was worried about what's going to happen this was our first full summer four weeks of camp and leadership training since COVID of course you know we had to take a year off which we only had some of our staff coming we had two years the past year this year we had all four weeks you know we don't know what's going to happen we don't know what God's going to do but we prayed and so you know we we, we prayed and prayed, and God sent the blessing, and he filled the camp up. All four weeks was wonderful. Uh, but this is just like Nehemiah. Nehemiah, I have uh, four points here. Nehemiah sent out, first point is the proposal. These, now this, this I, I like to picture myself here. I'm a visual person. I picture myself where I am. If I'm directions, I have to see where I'm going. Like I can see the turn and all that stuff. So I, I could picture, put myself in this story and see it and I can see that that Nehemiah is doing a good work you know he's working hard and he's got the, he had the king's blessing the king even paid for the wall you know a lot so he went down there and he's building the wall and he's got it just about done there's no more breaches in it and he hadn't put the doors up yet hadn't put the gates on it and then these people come to him Sanblat and Tobiah and Geshem the Arabian came to him and says we need to you need to come down here and meet they're getting nervous you know this this this, this guy is is Jerusalem, we know some of the prophecies. This guy's building a fortified city. You know, we need to do something about this. So they, they sent out a proposal. Come let us meet. But we know that a couple chapters back in chapter 4, verse 15 and 18, it talks about that they actually threatened them. And Nehemiah's workers, they had to, they had to fight with one hand using a, a tool and the other hand with a weapon. You know, and they were wearing their coats of mail, and they had the horn, the horn uh, blower right beside Nehemiah all the time, ready to, ready to fight. And how stressful would that be? Yeah. That would be a terrible way to build. But they were doing it, and, and they kept on doing it. <clears throat> and they proposed them, seeing that their attacks and mischief wasn't working, they said, let's get him out here. And, and Nehemiah says, oh, no, because they, they wanted to go to the plain of oh, no. <laughs> and, and they... they uh, they proposed it four different times. Now, they, this, they're persistent. You know, and, and you know what? who else is persistent? Y'all know who else is persistent. The devil is a very persistent devil. He's very good at what he does. He's very efficient in doing it. And he, he, they proposed this four different times. And Nehemiah, I love what he says here in verse 3. My second point is don't leave. And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? Why should the work cease? And we're, you're all ministers in here and, and missionaries and, and le or leaders in the church. You know, you have a ministry. And that is your personal ministry. God has a ministry for everybody because if not, it, when you're a Christian, God wants you to be with him, right? He, I love my children. I have three kids, a, a two girls and a boy. I love being around my kids. I love having them by my side. And when they're not there, the next time I see them, man, I, they, I wrap them up and they hug me. and It makes you feel like a million bucks, you know. Mm -hmm. And that's what Jesus wants. 
When we accept him and become his child, he wants us to be in his presence. I preached Sunday on, on John chapter 17, the, the Lord's high priestly prayer. And, and the Lord is, Jesus is longing for us to be home with him and to see his glory. You know, and that's like we were talking, I was talking to a gentleman about shooting a deer Saturday. And you know what the first thing I did when I got home? I drove straight to my back door and I got, went and got my kids and let them come out and see my glory. You know, look here, kids. Look at what I did. And uh, the glory was a little bit uh, undermined because my cousin Phil had shot a buck, an eight-point buck, and it was laying on top of my deer. And so, but oh well. But at that glory, Jesus longs to have us home with him. And so he leaves us here because he has, he has a specific ministry for us. And why should that work cease? And there's so many things in this world that cause us. Philippians 1.6 was our, our uh, key verse for this summer. Being confident in this very thing. He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will perform that work in you until you're home with him. So keep on working. Keep going. Don't leave the work. God's work must never cease. We talked about COVID. You know, I know churches that have not opened up since COVID. They have completely shut down. There was the, you know, the big flood over in Dismal and down this way. There's a church that hasn't opened back up because of that. God's work will cease. It's our job not to let his work cease. He, can use, he doesn't need us, but he chooses to use us and gives us that ministry. Don't leave. Don't leave the wall. Nehemiah didn't. Jesus didn't leave. Jesus stayed here. And he... And, Matthew 26, 53 says, he could have, God had given him 12 legions of angels. He could have at any time <coughs> called those legions of angels down and they could have wiped this world out and he could have went back home to where he was. But we were worth it. We're not worth it, but he thought we were. You know, and he did. He did not leave. And because he didn't leave, we shouldn't leave. And that 12 legions, I've researched it and done, done it. One legion is about 6,000 Angels and 12 legions would be about 72,000 angels. And one angel, one death angel, you know, killed all the firstborn. And, and then in times God will send down one angel and will just wipe nations out. Imagine what 72,000 could do, right? They, we, we don't, they don't stand a chance. It's just irrelevant. But don't leave. Jesus didn't leave. He stuck with it. The devil will try to distract you just like these people did. Five times in the end, they tried to distract him and get him away from the work, Nehemiah and his workers. Oh, there's so many distractions. I love to hunt, and hunting can be a distraction. I love to play basketball. Basketball and sports can be a distraction. Man, there are so many people in my church personally that, you know, when basketball season's in or when sports seasons are in because they're out doing that. You know, and, and that's, and especially on Wednesday nights. And, and you know, the work is ceasing because of something else. That's the distractions that they have. They have went down to the plane. You know, cell phones are the same things and TV. We, we cease from reading our, our Bible and having our daily quiet time or, or being with our kids even because of distractions. Don't let those distractions get you there. And this is important too. In uh, uh, verse 3, he, And I sent messengers unto them saying, I am doing a great work I, that I cannot come down. What does 2 Corinthians 6.14 say? Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. What business do we have with unbelievers? We don't need to meet with them. You were talking about the communion. There's, we don't have any business being there. You know, and people say, well, I'm going to go witness to them. I need, and yes, we need to go witness. But we don't have any business meeting with them. We need to be a separate thing, not in a snobbish, I'm better than you way. But I'm not doing that. Yeah. And, and I, I don't drink alcohol. And I... I have friends that drink alcohol or acquaintances that drink alcohol. I worked as an auto mechanic for eight years. You know, I've heard everything and, and have seen just about everything, you know. And I had a man come up to me that worked with me, and he was a Marine, and, and he found out that I didn't cuss. He says, he comes up to me and says, I have never met anybody that didn't cuss. And I said, well, nice to meet you, you know. And, and you know, I, and I, that is nothing good. That's just the way I was raised. That's mom and dad for that and God. But... But it's, we should stand out. We should be different. We have no business meeting with them. Don't go down to the valley and meet with them because they're just going to do you mischief. And Nehemiah was a wise man. He understood that. He knew that. He says, I'm not going to go down and meet with you because they mean me mischief. And I love that. I looked up that word mischief, and it's, it's to do harm. They were going to harm me. They're going to attack him and get him and harm him. 
so that the work would cease, God's work would cease. So don't meet with the enemy. We have no deals to, there are no deals to be made with the ungodly. And don't get pulled down. You've all seen that, that uh, illustration of some, someone standing. I used this at camp. Someone gets in a chair, and uh, I normally put this little, little kid in a chair, and a, and a big kid will come up and say, okay, pull them up to that chair, and they can't do it, you know. And I said, okay, and I pull them down. It's just boom, and they fall down. It's a lot easier to be pulled down than it is to be pulled up. Now, there are exceptions. There are lots of times when you can get, pull someone up and help them. But don't get pulled down. And there's so much stuff that there's easily, I, I like to fish, and I went in the ocean fishing this past summer. And uh, there was a couple times I had to cut my line and put a new hook on it because I got snagged. I got tied up in the, in the ocean. And I couldn't get my bait out, couldn't get my line back. And I had to cut it off because I got pulled down. And boy, that first man, it's real exciting because you, you, know, you get it in and there's something on it, you jerk it real hard and then it doesn't move and you know that you're snagged. But, uh, so don't get pulled down. Don't stoop down to their level. Stay up high. The next one I got is the open letter. And this is where it gets kind of interesting because they literally threaten Nehemiah in verse 5. Then they sent Sam like his servant unto me in like manner the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And this open letter, normally when a letter is sent to the king, y'all know it's sealed and no man is able to see it but the king. But they left this letter open because they wanted every hand to read it. And it was a lie. They said, in which was written, it is reported among the heathens, and, the, and Geshem said it, that thou the Jews think to rebel. They're going to rebel. For which cause thou buildest the wall, that thou mayest be king. They, they went to Nehemiah's ego. They said, you, I'm going to tell the king, send a letter, and everyone's going to see it along the way. And man, rumors are so bad. A lot of churches get divided just for simple for lack of a better word, stupid rumors, right? That are not even true. But one person hears it, then it goes to another one, and then it goes to another person. And before you know it, it's not even real. But it's a big deal, you know? And it, and it happens that way. And that's what this open letter was meant to be. It may not have even made it to the king, and the king may not have believed it. But the, the surrounding nations would be like, maybe they are trying to build a nation there. Maybe he is trying to be king. And then they said in verse 7, Thou hast appointed the prophets to preach of thee in Jerusalem. Now, I've never been preached of. I've been preached to many, many times. But I've never been preached of. But they, they, had, they accused Nehemiah of sending people out to preach of him, saying, Oh, we have the new king. He is the anointed of God. And there is a king in Judah. Now shall be board, reported to the king to these words, Come now, therefore, and let us take counsel together. Say, If you don't come meet with us, I'll send this letter to the king, and we'll see what becomes of your little wall, right? We'll see what becomes of your work. They sent this open letter. This, this was a letter, a real threat to Nehemiah, because the Persians back then, they didn't take kindly to, to uh, rebellions. If they thought someone was going to resist, they'd come in and wipe them out, right? So this was a real threat, and they said he was trying to be king, and it was open. They were trying to spread the lies, and... Satan loves to spread lies and to spread rumors. That's one thing in our church we need to be very, very careful of. And, and it's, here's another thing that got me, was we need to be careful what we believe. You know, and, and, so, and I think of, of, of course, women. It seems like if you get, if there's a man and a woman, everyone's going to believe the woman. And I'm not sexist or anything like that. But, but that's just the way it is, right? And so that woman could say anything. It doesn't matter if it's true or not. But we need to be careful of what we believe because right now, if you say something about a Christian, it's going to, they're, they're going to believe the bad because that's the way the world's been since forever, right? That's, the way Christ, that's one way to prove that Christianity is true because look at all these other religions. Even in America, every other religion is tolerated but Christianity, right? We're hit hard, you know? And so that's what we need to focus on. Be careful what you believe. You know, go to the God and pray about it. Don't just believe any rumor you hear. You need to go, it's best just to go straight to that person and say, hey, I heard this, is this true? And then let it go. Forget about it, right? Okay, then we get on to Nehemiah, what he, how he responds to this in the, such the right way. Then sent I unto him, saying, there is no such thing done as thou sayest. Thou hast finished, if that's how you say that word, or made up or invented these things. You lied them in your own heart. You made up these things in your own heart. For He calls them a liar. He handles this the right way. Now, Nehemiah was a man. First off, you know he's a man because he got all these people to build this wall. 
and led it up and headed it up. That's, that takes wisdom. He was, I think he was cupbearer to the king, you know, which has to be a, a good Stanley place. You know, he was a man, a wise man. But he straight up calls him a liar. And as a Christian, we need to stand up and say, I straight up think you're, that's wrong. It's okay to say that's wrong. And that's what so many churches are lacking today. They say, oh, well, we love everyone. We'll, we'll accept you into our church because Jesus is love. That's straight up wrong. I don't care what anybody says. You know what I mean? I mean, there's a man and there's a woman. It's, it's that obvious. You know, so it's okay to say that they're straight up wrong. He answered bluntly and called him a liar. Nehemiah went to the right place for him. This is also what I get about Nehemiah in, in verse 9. For they all made us afraid, saying, Their hands shall be weakened from the work, that it is not done. That's scary. Nehemiah was actually legit afraid here. Because they were already been working for a while with one hand on their weapon, one hand on their tool, and working, looking around, scared to death all day long. You know, and, and they were scared. And they were tired, and they were wore out, and they didn't know what to do. They didn't know where else to go. But Nehemiah went to the right place. Who did he go to? Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. And I like that part right there. I have it highlighted in my Bible. Oh God, strengthen my hands. Because our, our feet, when you talk about feet in the Bible, most times it's talking about traveling. When it talks about hands, it, it's talking about work. And, and the, the fruit of our, the labors of our hands, the works of our hands. And man, my hands have calluses on them from working. Well, not right now. I guess I'm being lazy. But uh, your hands are what works. And when I worked as a mechanic, my wedding day, my ring finger, the, the fingernail was blue, black and blue, where it got smashed with a wrench. And, and all our wedding pictures are like her hands over mine like this because they didn't want to show that big blue hand. But it's your hands that do the work, right? And they should be bruised. They should be bloodied. They should be tired because you're doing a great work. And why should you leave that work? If you bust your finger, put a bandit on it, get back to it, Right? Don't leave that work, but we need to pray to God. Strengthen our hands. And I love that saying, what, what, happen, what do you do when you get to the end of your rope? You hang on and you swing, right? And, and this, your hands is what hang on. Uh, you, you hang on with your hands and you hang on to God so tight that God just strengthen my hands so I can hang on to you. Because that's the only thing that really matters. As long as I'm hanging on to you, it doesn't matter what's going on around me. I just want to hold on to you. And you know what? He is the only one that can give us strength, right? And he will give us strength. Because we find out, if you read down in, chapter, in verse 15, that it says, So the wall was finished in the 20 and 5th day of the month of Elu, Elulu in 52 days. Isn't that amazing? Now, we have to remember that they were working with one hand and, and weapon in the other hand, and they were being attacked 52 days. God strengthened their hands, right? They got down, and they went to the right place. And then we got to the end of the rope. That's exactly where God wants us. And you all know that. I'm sure from personal experiences. When you get down, there's nothing else you can do. That's when God does his magic. Because it's not us that's doing it, because I'm done. But God, it's all you. All i got to do is hang, hang on to that rope. God, strengthen my hands so I can hang on. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this passage of Scripture. God, help us to go out as men and as women of the church, brothers and sisters in Christ, God, and to not slack away from our ministries, to do it, run into them headlong and work hard, but be wise, God, and don't get distracted by the, the messengers of the world. God, give us strength to complete our tasks. Strengthen our hands so that we can give you the glory and ultimately a crown to lay at your feet. In Jesus' name, amen.